You probably hear about GMOs a lot in the news and kind of the debate about allowing them and growing them and whatnot. So I think what's really important to talk about is the impacts of GMOs on human health, on the environment, on other organisms. Now, something to keep in mind, the definition of GMOs that I'm using is the introduction of DNA from another organism into an organism. So I'm using that definition versus the definition that also includes cultivars. So before we can talk too much about the impacts of GMOs on environment, health, etc., it's important that we look at the history of GMOs first, because this kind of gives us some context. So it wasn't until the 1970s that scientists were able to successfully transfer DNA from one organism to another. And we started with the most simplest of organisms, just looking at DNA from one bacteria to another bacteria. So only about at this point in time, about 50 years uh, old is this technology. Now, when we start thinking about human uses of GMO technology that actually wasn't too long after we kind of figured out how to do this. So about five years later in 1978, we were able to first derive human insulin from bacteria. And this is actually an amazing technology that has really changed the world, particularly with folks with diabetes. So insulin is a hormone. All hormones are proteins. And in our body, the way insulin works is it kind of signals our cells to take sugar out of the bloodstream and put it into our cells. So it's kind of the point of insulin. Folks that have type 1 diabetes, and I'm sure there's probably other disorders out there as well, can't make insulin. So their body never gets that signal to take sugar out of the bloodstream into their blood cells or into their body cells. So they do injections of insulin. Well, that insulin wasn't from humans donating insulin like humans donate blood. That insulin was made by bacteria. But it's not bacteria insulin. It's the actual human gene for insulin that we inserted into a bacteria. Excuse me. We insert it into a bacteria. The bacteria makes the human insulin, and then we have been able to figure out how to then extract that human insulin from all of the other components of bacteria. So this was really life-changing research, and, and we've done similar things with other proteins since. But again, still kind of relatively recent, looking at the late 70s. Now, this was with human health applications, but we're kind of talking about agriculture and like food stuff. So let's talk about food stuffs. So the first GMO food item for consumption wasn't until 1994. So only 30 years at this point. So this is when the first GMO food was released to the market for direct human consumption. And in case you're curious, they were called flavor saver tomatoes. Now what flavor saver tomatoes do or did is it was designed to give tomatoes a longer shelf life. So once you pick them and send them to a grocery store and they're at the grocery store, how long do they stay good and edible for consumption? And hence you got flavor saver tomatoes. Now you might be like, I have never heard of these before. Well, that's because they don't sell them anymore. What they later learned is that sure, the the outside skin of the tomato stayed intact, it stayed firm, but when you actually cut into that tomato, it was rotting from the inside. So it wasn't as noticeable at first. It looked like it was a success, but it wasn't. Now, the story of those tomatoes doesn't really matter, but really want to emphasize like this year, 1994 was the first year of consumption by humans. So now that we have a little basis of the history of GMOs, let's talk a little bit about more of their impacts. So one impact, and if we're looking at this, I should say when I say impact, I really mean negative consequences. There's a lot of positives of GMOs. It's enabling us to make more food than ever before to feed a growing population. They provide nutrients in foods such as rice that gets and addresses nutrient deficiencies in areas around the world. So a lot of positives, but the media doesn't focus on the positives. They focus on the negatives. So let's address those negatives. 
So when we're thinking about human health, uh, we don't know yet, right? They have only been out for 30 years, uh, which, you know, that kind of sounds like a long time. But if you think about a human lifespan, you know, humans live a whole lot longer than 30 years. So we, we are living in the biggest experiments, even if we don't want to be. Right, so we are consuming GMOs now. You, I don't care what your diet is, you are consuming GMOs and likely you're consuming them daily. I guess it depends on where in the world you're watching this, but at least here in the United States, you're consuming them all the time. And we don't really know long-term effects because it hasn't been long-term yet. I will say is that there have been zero cases of human poisoning from GMOs. And honestly, this shouldn't be too surprising. We're inserting genetic material into the DNA. That's going to affect, you know, the way that organism grows, but it's DNA we've already been exposed to. You and I get no meaningful nutrition from the DNA that we eat. It's not surprising there's no negative health effects. And I personally would not be surprised if there's no long-term health effects. And I've got some more data to back that up um, in another video. Now, human health really isn't a concern, short-term or long-term, but it should be fair, we don't quite know yet. The biggest concern with GMOs actually has to do with the environment. So in a previous video, when I was talking about pesticides, I talked about how we as humans are actually cultivating super pests, pests that we cannot kill. And the reason for that is we spray pesticides, the most fit pests survive, they pass on that gene of being fit to the next generation, so on and so forth. Well, sure, with some of these GMOs, you don't need to spray pesticides anymore because we've integrated that crop with some sort of internal pesticide. Well, it's still gonna have the same effect. Pests that have the highest resistance are the ones who live, they reproduce and pass that on. So GMOs isn't addressing this issue of super pests. Uh, honestly, it's just making it easier uh, for super pests to be developed. Another downside um, that they, the manufacturers of GMOs do try to address is that this GMO technology or, or maybe even the DNA from GMOs does spread to other crops. This is a bigger deal in the legal sense. So for example, there's a, literally just a handful of cases where small farmers have been getting sued by Monsanto, which is one of our biggest producers of GMOs, because in that farmer's farm, uh, in, in their lot, there were GMO crops that the farmer didn't buy. But what happened is say a bee from a GMO crop flew over to the farmers and the pollen that was on that bee spread to the plants um, on that farmer's crop. And Monsanto's like, oh, you're growing this, but you didn't pay for it, we're gonna sue you. And it's kind of dumb, um, but it's an unfortunate reality. Now I mentioned they are trying to address this. So GMOs are made to be sterile. They'll probably still create pollen, but the genetic material in it is just non-viable. But no technology is 100%, uh, which is why these small cases pop up. Now there is a little bit of shadiness. Oh, they can't reproduce. So that means farmers have to buy seed every single year versus making their own seed bank. You might think like, oh, that's kind of scummy. That's a way for these companies to make more money. And while I'm sure they don't mind that benefit, I genuinely think the main reason is to prevent these GMOs from breeding uh, with other non-GMO plants. Plants, unlike animals, pollen and from different plant species can easily hybridize. So plants can easily hybridize, whereas animals, that really doesn't happen. And so I think the bigger concern is that this GMO technology then breeding into weeds, for example, right? You wouldn't want weeds to have this technology of really anything, right? You don't want to give weeds an advantage that prevents them from dying and allows them to be pro more prolific. So Monsanto kind of lucked out like, oh, oh no, we have to get more money from farmers because they have to buy our seed every year. 
But there really is an actual application to pre uh, preventing this use. And then finally, uh, kind of similar to the super pests, the creation of GMOs that particularly create their own pesticide has a similar issue to pesticide use in general, is that pesticide can negatively impact organisms we want around. You know, and here I say pollinators, but also natural predators. So a lot of the GMO concerns is more related to the environment, and it's more related to the GMOs that specifically are creating pesticides. Maybe you've heard of these crops before called BT crops. Um, BT stands for a, I believe a fungi, it could be a bacterium, I'm pretty sure it's a fungi, a fungi that creates a, a natural toxin against pests. So a lot of these downsides are actually more related to those BT GMO crops versus, you know, GMO crops such as those that add more vitamin A to rice. Not too many downsides with those. So with that, again, when it comes to human health, you're fine. And, and you're likely going to be fine. Just the way our body metabolizes food, I personally cannot foresee, and everything I've read, that it's going to negatively impact our health. But there are actual, real, tangible impacts of GMOs to the environment, particularly GMOs that create their own pesticides. And so this next video is all about regulating GMOs that kind of address some of these impacts.